and who wanted to be president, but Democratic primary voters did not share that desire. So former Governor John Hickenlooper is back, running for the Senate, a job he said he didn't want and wouldn't be good at. Two men Coloradans know well, with clear disagreements on health care, the economy, immigration, the Supreme Court, and how to handle the pandemic. Now all that's left is for them to debate and you to decide. Brought to you by Nine News in association with Colorado Politics and the Fort Collins Coloradoan and broadcast statewide by stations in every corner of Colorado. Presented live from the campus of Colorado State University in Fort Collins. Next presents Race for the Senate. Here are your moderators, Kyle Clark and Marshall Zellinger. Good evening. Next expands to a commercial free hour statewide this evening for this U.S. Senate debate. We are following public health guidelines as well as the guidance from our hosts here at Colorado State University. So we're holding this debate without an audience, with social distancing, and with health checks for everyone here. And that includes our candidates for U.S. Senate, Republican Senator Cory Gardner, who for the remainder of this debate will refer to as Mr. Gardner, and his Democratic challenger, John Hickenlooper, who will also refer to as Mr. Hickenlooper. The topics and questions have been selected by the journalists of Nine News, ColoradoPolitics.com, and the Coloradoan, and have not been shared in advance with anyone. The candidates will have one minute for answers, 30 seconds for rebuttals with extended discussion at our discretion. You as voters deserve a debate filled with clear answers to clear questions and for the candidates to have an opportunity to speak without interrupting one another. We'll also have at least one opportunity this evening for the candidates to pose direct questions to one another. So let's get started. Colorado's COVID-19 hospitalizations are at their highest point since the initial wave of the pandemic here back in the spring. Our test positivity rate just today hit 5%. That's a warning to public health experts. The same question to both of you to begin tonight. What is the single most important thing that we could do to improve our pandemic response and what or who is standing in the way? Mr. Gardner. Well, thank you, Kyle. Thank you to Channel 9 News and thanks to Colorado State University. It's great to be back on campus as a Colorado State University graduates, uh, great to be here and to all of the other sponsors of this event. A couple things we have to do. Number one, we must pass a relief package out of the United States Congress that follows up on the relief packages that we've already passed. This package would include support for people with unemployment benefits, uh, additional dollars for vaccines, dollars for child care, dollars for education, uh, the help for small businesses, allowing Paycheck Protection Program dollars to be back into the hands of businesses to keep their doors open to make sure that we have a second draw on the loan. Those are the kind of things that we need to be pursuing. We also need to make sure that we're following social distancing, our guidances, and making sure that people are practicing good hygiene, including wearing a mask. But I will say this and start this evening off with what John Hickenlooper would have done in the United States Senate had he been there. He would have voted against the very bill that I described. Why? Because he said he would. A bill that would have provided unemployment relief, a bill that would have provided relief for education, for child care, new dollars for vaccine. We can't afford to have somebody who refuses to support the people of Colorado in the Senate. Mr. Gardner, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hickenlooper, as he mentioned you, you can have a bit of extra time for rebuttal. If we want to have a longer discussion on this, we can. I'll restate the question for our viewers. What is the single most important thing we could do to improve our pandemic response and who or what is standing in the way? So um, we did see here as, a, as an introduction what I think we'll see a lot, uh, that Cory Gardner is going to spend a fair amount of time on the attack. Uh, I think there'll be a, a, a fair amount of distortion and exaggeration. Uh, but I'll go to the question. Uh, the most important thing we can do is pass relief, uh, make sure that relief gets passed out of, out of the Congress. And again, Corey and I agree on this. Actually, four days ago, uh, Corey was emphatic that he thought that COVID relief should take precedence and be a higher priority than uh, making sure that we rush through this Supreme Court nomination, which is where the Senate focus seems to be. And I think the question has to be asked, uh, if COVID relief is the most important thing, making sure that we get testing capacity and, and, and you know, the PP protective equipment, PPE for everyone, why, I mean, Corey could just say, I will not vote to support this thing, this projection, this Supreme Court nominee, uh, if, the, if indeed the, the Relief Act doesn't get passed first. And there are two senators that said yesterday that they were not going to vote for it. His 
his priority and setting that priority clear would be a, 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 a strong point toward getting relief. We're here in northern Colorado, where the JBS meatpacking plant saw one of the largest COVID-19 outbreaks in the state. Mr. Gardner, you bragged about getting tests for JBS workers. Union leaders say that those tests never arrived. Uh, JBS also didn't test all its workers before reopening as it has promised. Mr. Gardner, JBS is a significant donor to your campaign. Did that company properly protect its workers, and did you deliver the 5,000 tests promised? Well, thank you, Marshall, for the question. I worked very closely with the state of Colorado and Governor Polis. And in fact, uh, if you look at the record, you will see that Governor Polis said every employee at JBS who wants a test can get a test. Uh, that's not me saying it. That's not the news saying it. That's Governor Polis saying that there were tests for employees if they wanted them. We have to make sure that we're protecting employees. We have to make sure that we have personal protective equipment for our employees, whether they're working at a restaurant, whether they're working at a meatpacking plant. We also have to recognize the challenges that our food supply system went through uh, when we uh, had the initial stages of the pandemic hit. Uh, our workers at JBS were heroes, and that's why I worked closely with the governor to make sure that we had those tests uh, that they needed to make sure that we had them. Uh, and so we need to continue that effort to s provide a secure food chain, to provide a secure uh, food supplies for our country. Uh, but when Governor Hickenlooper was in office, he had a chance to get the personal protective equipment that we needed for the state. And yet he refused to provide the personal protective equipment stockpile that could have protected us. Before I allow a rebuttal from Mr. Hickenlooper, did the 5,000 tests arrive and the union is lying? Or well, you would have to we again, you would have to again check with the governor. The governor said that they got all the tests that they needed for every employee if every employee wanted one. Mr. Hickenlooper, you were name checked in this. Did you fail Colorado by not having proper PPE years earlier? No, no that's ridiculous. Um, Governor Polis has done a remarkable job. And I think we should recognize that uh, his efforts have been uh, superlative. I talked to a number of the workers at JBS, uh, and they are emphatic that they did not get testing capacity, that they were asked and then forced to go back to work without having that, that knowledge of who's infected and who isn't. Uh, and I think that's a, a question of willful negligence, that, that they, we ask them to go back and protect our source of food without giving them the, the protections that any of us would expect. May I respond? You may. Well, thank you. And again, I, what you heard from a former governor is that he takes no responsibility for failing to prepare Colorado for a pandemic. We actually have a state audit that shows while he was governor they failed to prepare the state of Colorado for a pandemic. Communications problems still exist today, the same communications problems that he had when he was governor. And so I don't think he can pass the buck. We don't need somebody in Washington, D.C. who thinks it's about himself, refuses to take responsibility, and won't do the job for Colorado. He won't do it here. He certainly won't do it in Washington. Mr. Gardner, thank you. Mr. Hagenlooper, a question for you as we continue our discussion about the best way to get COVID relief to the people who need it. Democrats in Congress have loaded up some of these COVID relief bills and economic stimulus bills with a bunch of goodies for political allies of theirs. Whether or not you agree with that approach, it's tough to say that that hasn't slowed things down. For the sake of speed alone, should Democrats in Congress quit doing that? I think what we need to get into Washington is this ability to actually negotiate. What's been to me most frustrating is we haven't seen any willingness on the Republican or the Democratic side to sit down and actually roll up their sleeves and find where do we agree, where do we disagree, and begin looking at it. We've gone six months now since we've had any relief. If people uh, that stopped getting their unemployment insurance in July, their, uh, their rent protections have gone uh, by, they, they don't have health care in many cases. Uh, this has gone on long enough, and yet one side or the other continue to say, oh no, it's their fault, and they're, they're pointing fingers. This is the status quo. This is what I want to go to Washington and change because we need negotiation. We need people to sit down and work out what the differences are. Again, Corey said four, uh, four days ago uh, in our debate that he would place a priority on this. If he stood up and said, we're not, I'm not going to vote for a justice until we get relief, then we'd get relief. Then we'd get negotiation. That's what we need to move forward. The time has expired, but I didn't hear an answer to the question, so I'll ask again. I know you say both sides need to negotiate. I asked you about your side, the side that you might have some influence with. Do you think that, re that Democrats should stop loading up these uh, economic and COVID bills with, with goodies to get them through faster? Yes, certainly. If I was in Washington, okay. I would do everything I can to make sure that there was an efficient process to get you know, a, lean, uh, a lean bill to put forward. Okay. Thank you very much.
a few times tonight, you're going to hear Wait, us. Can I respond to that if you don't mind? I think we're we're going to move on and talk about the associated issue of healthcare now. If you really want to return to a topic, we can do that in Q and A. Thank you. Uh, a few times tonight, you're going to hear us reference disparity in Colorado, and that's a project that we have at Nine News that's studying the impact of racial disparities in our state, and one of them is healthcare. The percentage of black and Latino Coloradans with health insurance almost doubled with the expansion of Medicaid coverage and the Affordable Care Act. Mr. Gardner, if you succeed in getting rid of the Affordable Care Act, the loss of health insurance would disproportionately fall on black and Latino Coloradans at the same time that the pandemic is disproportionately affecting those communities. Has that situation given you any pause about trying to repeal the ACA? Well, thank you, Kyle. I don't think this has to be a zero-sum game. I don't think it's either the Affordable Care Act or nothing. In fact, Governor Hickenlooper has said that he wants to replace the Affordable Care Act with a plan that he led several years ago with Governor John Kasich. We need to make sure that we are helping people, minority, African-American, black populations, Hispanic populations in this state and across this country. Uh, under my plan, we will focus on a patient-centered care system. Uh, we will allow people to increase their quality of care by decreasing the cost of care. We will do so through re reinsurance programs and risk pools. We also have to recognize the work that we have done for minority communities across Colorado by growing our economy. If you're uh, black families in this state, in this country, have seen their wealth on average grow by 33 percent. Hispanic families have seen their wealth grow by 65 percent as a result of the economic policies. It's not a zero-sum game. Where I'm concerned, though, with is Governor Hickenlooper's plan to replace the Affordable Care Act, which would lead to a government-run program that would take 176 million Americans' insurance policies away from their workplace. That's his plan. That's irresponsible to destroy over 170 million That's Americans' time. insurance. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Uh, Mr. Hickenlooper, he described this plan that you're interested in uh, with former Governor Kasich. Uh, this is something that's come up in a number of your discussions. So 30 seconds now for you to tell us, what is that plan? Are you still pursuing it? And what would it mean to Coloradans? So I only get 30 seconds to, because you don't want me just to design or to talk to this my... Is, this is your rebuttal, and he's, he is describing your plan, and I'm giving you 30 seconds to tell folks what that plan actually Got it. is. Okay, so John Kasich, the Republican governor of Ohio, who had also expanded Medicaid, we came together not to replace the Affordable Care Act. That's, that I never said that. He never said that. We were looking at ways that we could improve it, and especially focusing on ways that we could make the exchanges more cost effective for people because that's one of the the problems you know the affordable care act uh the republicans have tried to take it away they've never allowed us to report it uh to to repair it or improve it not repair it, but improve it and again and again these attacks are going to uh, are threatening to dismantle it completely without us uh, any kind of uh, uh, suitable replacement thank you mr hickenlooper mr gardner the affordable care act still exists exists some might call that pre-existing Yet you've introduced an eight-line bill that you say will require insurance companies to cover pre-existing conditions. What part of that bill requires an insurance company to offer me coverage in the first place? Yeah, the bill itself requires coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. That's what the bill does. Uh, it's uh, maybe only eight lines. I'll remind you that we're here today under a First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, freedom to assemble, obviously, that was 45 words long. And I think the First Amendment got it pretty doggone right. This is a guiding principle that both Democrats and Republicans actually agree to, that we will provide coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, and we will make sure that the insurance companies, that's what my bill does, provide that coverage. Now, there may be some that disagree. Let's work on it together to make sure that it's right. That's the guiding principle, just as our First Amendment is the guiding principle for uh, freedom of speech. Let's make sure that that protection for pre-existing conditions continues. What you heard Governor Hickenlooper say, though, is now he is saying he didn't want to replace the Affordable Care Act, but he is on record saying he wants to go to a government-run health care system. The danger of that is the destruction that it would have, the harm it would have on our rural hospitals. We're already in the bottom half of access for health care thanks to his failed leadership while he was governor. Mr. Gardner, I didn't hear the answer to the part of the question of which part of the bill offers insurance, requires insurance companies to offer it to everyone. And I'll just add that the current Affordable Care Act includes a section entitled Guaranteed Availability of Coverage. If the Affordable Care Act were to be repealed, that guarantee goes away with it. Where does that exist in your eight lines? Marshall, the bill requires people to be covered if they have a pre-existing condition. That's what the bill does. It is a bill that provides that guidance, that principle that we will cover people 
with pre-existing conditions. That's the bill. Now, you may have a different interpretation. I look for every single one of the 11 bills that I've passed and signed into law, they've changed from the time they were in committee to the time they got signed into law. If people want to make this better, let's do it. But the guiding principle remains. I support and will demand and continue to demand coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. I will not, like Governor Hickenlooper, <laughs> take away the insurance from 176 million Americans. I just want to put a button on this. If the ACA were to go away and this bill exists, does everyone get coverage who wants it? That's my bill. Okay. My bill requires people, it, 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 pre-existing conditions you're saying? If, if yes, you're requiring so my bill, bill requires people to get coverage with pre-existing conditions. If that's the question, that's the answer. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Mr. Hickenlooper, you were the first person held in contempt by Colorado's Independent Ethics Commission, which found that you broke the law in accepting illegal gifts. You've blamed Republicans. You've misleadingly claimed that you were exonerated on dozens of allegations. And you told Marshall that journalists should be protecting you on this. Do you regret breaking the law? And perhaps more importantly, will you change your behavior if voters return you to elected office? Well, I recognize that, that there were two reporting errors, and the Ethics Commission found us in violation uh, for those two occasions. Uh, the Denver Post referred to it as relatively minor and honest mistake. I can guarantee you they were inadvertent. We had a team of people that worked on this, um, but they obviously weren't perfect. Uh, I think we should recognize that these allegations came from uh, a dark money Republican organization that was created two days before all these allegations were filed. and. Their sole purpose was to try and create uh, material for, uh, for attack ads. As I think everyone in Colorado has seen uh, this summer, uh, those attack ads were relentless. And that's bringing Washington politics to Colorado. We, again, I, am, I paid the $2,800 fine. I take responsibility for that. Um, I certainly will make sure that that never happens again. When I went, I testified for three hours in front of the commission and told the truth to every, qu to every question they asked. Thank you, Mr. Hickenlooper. Mr. Hickenlooper, another question about honesty and ethics comes from Ernest Lunning. It's a recorded question, and he's with our partners at coloradopolitics.com. Governor, you've been endorsed by all the leading gun safety organizations who point to legislation you signed in 2013. But after signing those bills, you told Colorado sheriffs that you hadn't expected the magazine ban to be so controversial and that you only signed it because a staff member had committed you. Saying one thing publicly and then privately saying the opposite, that's something you accused Senator Gardner of doing. How are you any different? Um, let me be very clear. Uh, I stand by my record on, on gun safety. We're the first purple state to actually roll up our sleeves and, and pass universal background checks. Uh, to this day, uh, Cory Gardner, Mitch McConnell, don't think that universal background checks really work. They're not sure it's worth the $10. They, it, they can't, no one can get it onto the floor as long as Mitch McConnell is the majority leader of the Senate because they, don't, they just don't think it's effective enough. The bottom line is, and, and step back and look at this, the, uh, Cory Gardner has received almost $4 million in support from the NRA and gun manufacturers. Mitch McConnell has received even more I mean, this is big money at play in politics, I think. And, you know, Cory Gardner's received more, you know, corporate PAC money, $5.7 million, than any elected official in, in Colorado history. And, you know, suddenly the corporations get these massive uh, tax breaks. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Hickenlooper. If, if I, I think could I, respond. I, let's, let's jump in. But if we could target the question to what Coloradans know, okay? Coloradans know what our gun rights or gun control landscape looks like. So perhaps you could explain, uh, Mr. Gardner, what gun control laws we have in Colorado that you don't think apply or should, should be passed nationwide. He talked about universal background checks, but we've got a lot of other things. Could you compare what we have here to what you'd like to see nationwide? Well, look, I, I also want to, to reply to uh, the governor's attacks because uh, he has uh, attacked uh, quite frequently in this debate, and we haven't always had a chance. I haven't always had a chance to respond. Uh, look, uh, I support our Second Amendment, and I believe we have uh, laws in place that need to be enforced. Uh, but I don't think that when it comes to uh, prohibiting a sale between a, a father and a son, uh, interfering at that level, that that's a good thing for our country. Now, uh, Colorado may be handling this in a different way, but I don't think that we should infringe on those rights uh, that uh, our family sales, uh, you know, my, my, if I want to give my son the 12-gauge that I grew up uh, learning to hunt with, I ought to be able to do that. 
If you look at some of the bans that uh, the governor put in place, the experts said they, uh, they had very limited effect, and he lied to the county sheriffs about that. He lied to the county sheriffs about that effort. He wants a national gun license. He wants everybody in this state to have a national federal license for that firearm infringing on our Second Amendment rights. What he's saying here is different than what he actually wants to do in Washington. It's this, this two John Hickenloopers. Uh, one seems to say something here, one wants to do something there. That's it time. is not right for our state. Mr. Thank Hickenlooper, you, for 30 seconds, I want to give Ernest a fair chance at an answer sure. to this question. He asked an introspective question about yourself, saying sure. one thing publicly, saying something else privately, and you spent your entire time telling me about Cory Gardner. The question was about you. Right. So, again, I stand by my record on gun safety. Uh, my original intention was that we should have the magazine limits would pass uh, a year later uh, for a variety of reasons that that moved forward uh, uh, rapidly. The bottom line is that we need, we, we, before the COVID, we, ha, we were having one mass shooting a day. And it's long overdue that we begin looking at how do we keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people. And universal background checks is an obvious way of doing that. Making sure that we don't have high capacity magazines uh, available to uh, who, whenever and whoever wants them is, Can, a, a, is I, an I, equal I, challenge. I have to say a, a Nine News investigation has found that they're still widely available uh, high capacity magazines. So that, that talking point we have proven hasn't changed what exists in Colorado. But if if I can be, and I'm not trying to be argumentative, uh, oftentimes when, when laws are passed, it takes a while. It takes years sometimes before they become the norm. They become part of culture. But if you don't pass the laws, if you don't set uh, requirements that everyone who's going to buy a gun should give them their driver's license, should, we should be able to find out whether they, I mean, we found when we did the, looked at the background checks for 2012, there were 138 people who'd been convicted of homicide in Colorado. They tried to buy a gun and we stopped them. If you, I could, we're going to have time for, for time. If we're going to have time back now, and forth. Because I think it's important. Uh, Look, uh, w Governor. Mr. Gardner, we're uh, going to have time to talk back and forth well, in a moment. We've, okay. Uh, we're going to shift now to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who died. 46 days before Election Day. Four years ago, Justice Antonin Scalia died 269 days before the election. And four years ago, you said, quote, our next election is too soon and the stakes are too high. The American people deserve a role in this process. Now you're okay with a vote on the nominee. My question is not about the Supreme Court. Why should anyone trust that you'll stand by anything you're telling us tonight? Well, thank you, because in 2016, uh, when this occurred, uh, I was expressing the Senate's ability to follow its requirement of advice and consent under the Constitution and to follow uh, the precedent at the time, which was laid out by uh, then uh, Vice President Joe Biden at, in, during his time in the U.S. Senate. Uh, today, we're following the precedent laid out uh, since the late 1800s uh, and continuing to uh, adhere to the advice and consent of the United States uh, Constitution. Uh, the Constitution very clearly allows a president to nominate to the Senate to provide that advice and consent. We did not provide that consent in 2016 based on the precedent. Uh, as we have the nominations and the hearings today, we'll move forward. Uh, to be clear, though, uh, the American people, the people of Colorado, certainly deserve a chance to get an answer from Joe Biden and John Hickenlooper on what they want to do uh, to the United States Supreme Court. And it involves court packing. I asked John last week uh, if he supported court packing. I don't know if you want to answer that tonight, John, but I would just say this. Joe Biden doesn't think the people of Colorado or this country deserve an answer on court packing. I hope that you agree Coloradans deserve an answer on whether or not you support packing the courts with additional judges. All right, Mr. Gardner, thank you very much. Mr. Hickenlooper, uh, I do want to talk about this issue because it's something that's been in the news. Both you and Joe Biden have avoided answering whether you would support expanding the size of the Supreme Court or other measures that could be seen as either retaliation or reform based on what Republicans have done with the Supreme Court. Um, so let's try this in a different format. Let's try these as yes, no, or I don't want to say. <laughs> Do you support expanding or packing the Supreme Court if Republicans confirm Amy Coney Barrett? Yes, no, or I don't want to say. It's a, it's a hypothetical. I would support it. Let's put it this way. I don't like the idea of court packing. We're seeing it right now, right? We're seeing court packing in full fury, uh, and it doesn't make any sense to me. I think if you get new people to Washington, you won't have to do that kind of institutional change. And that's All right, we're going to go on to the next yes, no, or I don't want to say question. Do you support term limits for Supreme Court justices? Again, there are so many variables. I, uh, no, I mean, I don't support uh, term limits at this point, but who could say in the future, right? Another idea has been rotating lower court judges onto the Supreme Court for fresh blood. Yes, no, or I don't want to say. 
I've never heard that, so I okay. haven't thought about it. That's fair enough. Do you support expanding the size of lower courts to reshape the judiciary? Again, I haven't, uh, I haven't seen the pros and cons. I have not fair enough. delved into that. Uh, another thing that's been talked about that Democrats could do in retaliation for what the Republicans are doing with the Supreme Court is creating statehood for the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Yes, no, don't want to weigh in? You no, know, I think those are different issues that were, have been discussed long before we got into this. But it's being discussed in the context of a retaliatory action because of well, the Well, just for the record, long before we saw this kind of court packing, mm -hmm. I have said that I think Washington, D.C. should be a state. So I'm on the record of that, but it, it has nothing to do with court packing. Understood. And Puerto Rico? Uh, Puerto Rico, uh, I don't think I'm on the record, but I could be persuaded. I mean, again, this is a, it's no different or it's similar in many ways to Hawaii when we brought Hawaii into the, uh, as part of the United States. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Gardner, uh, on the court, uh, President Trump's Supreme Court nominee, Amy Coney Barrett, she's personally opposed to abortion. Uh, and she said today that Roe versus Wade is not a super precedent. It's, it's not safe from being uh, reversed. Last week, there were a couple of conservative justices on the court that suggested that gay marriage should also be overturned. Are you comfortable with overturning a woman's right to an abortion and gay Americans' right to marry? Both cases are settled law. I think we've heard uh, that discussion quite at depth today, actually, about settled law and the precedent, and that, res that precedent should be respected. But I also want to make sure that we understand here what court packing means. It is a Orwellian spin in newspeak to say that court packing is what is taking place today. Court packing for uh, 100 years, 150 plus years in this country's history has been identified as adding judges to the lower courts or to the U.S. Supreme Court until you get enough judges on the court to rule your way. Now, John knows exactly what court packing means. He's trying to hide tonight behind uh, the law fulfilling of nominations and approval by the United States Senate. So the question is to Governor Hickenlooper, do you support... Do you support adding justices to the Supreme Court more than 9, 10, or 11? That's the question he should answer, because that's the definition of court packing. Ruth Bader Ginsburg opposed it. So just as a quick follow-up then, uh, on the principle that you just outlined, one consequence of court packing or expanding the court is that Democrats do it, then Republicans do it again, then Democrats do it again. You just get this larger and larger and larger court, which, which could water down the judiciary. I assume, based on what you're saying, that if you were reelected and continue to serve in the Senate, that if Democrats expand the court or pack the court, that you would adamantly oppose Republicans doing it in return. Absolutely. Years later. Look, okay. the, nine and, the nine has worked for over 150 okay. years. Thank you very we much. We don't need more. It's worked for 150 years. It's too bad that Governor Hickenlooper can't admit that. Okay, well, Mr. Mr. Garner, this is, this is the part you've been waiting for. You've left a, a question dangling out there. This is the opportunity to ask each other a question. Okay. It's a 60-second answer. It's a question from you. I just heard one. I don't know, maybe it's the same one you're about to ask, but Mr. Gardner, I'll let you ask the first question. Well, uh, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, over the last several months, we have seen a great division in our country. We've seen uh, racial injustice. We've seen racial inequality. We've seen uh, the murder of George Floyd on television. We've seen defund police movements across the country. We've seen violence this weekend with the death of a protester. Governor Hickenlooper, you supported a fund called Chinook that included funding for Recreate 68, a radical organization that demanded violence at the 2008 convention in Denver that supports defunding the police, that supports violence against police. Do you stand by your support today for Recreate 68? <laughs> I, I don't know anything about Recreate 68. I, Chinook was a, a, a foundation where uh, community activists trying to improve their own community had the responsibility and the opportunity to give grants out to all kinds of people, uh, all kinds of organizations. Uh, I am completely, I was not involved, I haven't been involved in a grant from Chinook, from the Chinook Fund in 30 years. So uh, again, I don't, the whole point of Chinook is they're trying to uh, allow people that opportunity to make decisions that in, uh, improve their own community. Mr. Hagenluber, you can ask a question of Mr. Gardner now. Uh, so, Senator Gardner, you have uh, talked about your, the meeting you convened in January, uh, uh, really one of the first meetings to recognize the seriousness of, of COVID-19. Uh, and then, and I think there are a couple senators who actually sold stock there, 
But then three weeks later, you came back to Colorado Springs. There was a large rally with President Trump. Many thousands of people, most of them without masks and shoulder to shoulder, were there. And as you stood side by side with Donald Trump, you didn't warn anyone, any of the Coloradans, about the risk that they were, they were facing by being in that rally. Why was that? Yeah, thank you, uh, Governor Hickenlooper. Uh, look, I held the very first briefing in the United States Senate, demanded the very first briefing in the United States Senate to make sure that we heard from Admiral Girard, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Redfield to discuss what was happening with this novel coronavirus. I had hoped that everybody in the Senate would attend this briefing. Unfortunately, there were only about 12 people because at the very beginning of the virus, so January, February, people were uh, encouraging, like Nancy Pelosi, to go to a Chinatown, to uh, Mayor de Blasio, encouraging people to go out and eat. There were mistakes at every level of government in the very beginning days, including the experts who said, we don't know if masks are effective or not. We have to improve our response every single minute of the day. That's our local levels, our state and federal levels, and that's what I continue to focus on. I wish more people would have attended that very first hearing. A, a clarifying question, Mr. Gardner, because this is something that we want to bring up as well. Um, at the time of that February rally, uh, when you were shoulder to shoulder with, with President Trump, we now know, thanks to the journalist Bob Woodward, what the president actually thought of COVID-19 at that point, that it was tremendously serious, way worse than the flu, airborne, and so forth. Did President Trump tell you before you stood next to him in that crowd that he knew all those things? Did you have that knowledge? No, I did not. But we knew this was something that we had to deal with. We knew that we had something from China uh, that we didn't understand. China was lying to us at the time. Uh, China was lying to the world, saying it couldn't be transmitted the way that we now know that it can. The WHO was covering up for China. And so, look, we have to make sure that we don't say, follow the same mistakes that Nancy Pelosi made inviting people to uh, Chinatown or Mayor de Blasio inviting people to go out to dinner. But I also think it's important that we stand up to places like China. Governor Hickenlooper just last week said that China is not a problem. China isn't a bad country. That's, Yet they that's gave time us there. To, to the clarify, I wasn't, I wasn't asking you about China or, or Nancy Pelosi or, 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 any, or anybody else. I was asking you whether you wish the president had leaned over and told you what he knew, which was, this is really bad, way worse than I'm saying, and here we are with a crowd of however many tens Look, of thousands Look, I don't know what he knew or didn't know. I certainly wish that we would have had all of the information at the very beginning of this. The World Health Organization, China, uh, what they were lying about. Look, I think if you look at what Nancy Pelosi, I bring that up because Nancy Pelosi was saying at the beginning of this, let's go out to Chinatown, Mayor de Blasio, let's I think go we've out covered this. So I'm thank just you. saying that there was a lot of mistakes early on throughout this entire, okay. on, on, on all sides of this. Okay, thank you. We got the question to each other out of the system. That's good. <laughs> uh, let's return to disparity in Colorado, our project to discuss uh, racial equality and specifically police reform. Mr. Hickenlooper, during your term as Denver mayor from 2003 to 2011, Denver City Council approved more than $6 million to settle use of force cases or deaths involving law enforcement, settlements and incidents that have continued since. How will you be able to reform these problems as a senator when you weren't as mayor and even governor? So I look at the progress we made uh, when Paul Childs was shot uh, before I was even inaugurated as, as a mayor. We began police reform. We worked with the Black Ministerial Alliance. Uh, and we created some of the first major reforms, Civilian Oversight Commission, and, uh, an Office of the Independent Monitor who investigate claims of, of, of misconduct by the police. Uh, and we began trying to hold police officers accountable. I think what's uh, remarkable is that Colorado, our General Assembly this past year, actually on a bipartisan level, passed legislation that is a model for what we should be able to do nationally. They, they banned chokeholds, they banned uh, uh, no-knock warrants, they required police officers to keep their cameras on. They held uh, police officers accountable for their actions. They, they, they passed the limitations on qualitative immunity. Uh, this is the, the type of reforms that, that, that need to go to, the, to Washington. Instead of what we've seen so far in Washington, has just been suggestions uh, without any real, real teeth. Thank you, Mr. Hickenlooper. Mr. Gardner, how do you believe systemic racism affects Coloradans, and what have you done about it? Well, look, I, I, I believe that this country is inherently good. Uh, I believe that this nation is a great nation that has made mistakes, yes, that we learn from those mistakes, yes. Our souls were seared in a way, perhaps, that we've never seen with the murder, watching it, uh, of George Floyd. And we must make sure that we are passing reforms like the Justice Act that John Hickenlooper has belittled here tonight. Legislation that would have provided tracking for police violence and opportunities for us to get more dollars in the hands of states to do the right thing when it comes to uh, police reforms. 
Uh, we need to make sure that we pass the Justice Act. We need to make sure that we focus on things like the, the First Step Act, which is our bill to reform sentencing. Uh, our efforts to provide historically black colleges and universities with mandatory funding so that we can bring more equality. But again, what you didn't hear from John Hickenlooper tonight is why he didn't step away and, and why he didn't condemn Recreate 68, which called for violence, which called for defunding police, why he won't call for an investigation into what he now describes as a murder of Marvin Booker. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Let's talk about climate change and the energy in industry. And the questions come from J.C. Marmaduke, who's written on the environment and politics for our partners at the Colorado. Mr. Gardner, first for you. We're continuing to see impacts of climate change play out in Colorado in the form of devastating wildfires, record heat, and intensifying drought. You portrayed yourself as an environmental advocate in recent campaign ads, but over the last three years, you voted to roll back limits on greenhouse gas emissions from the fossil fuel industry and confirm former fossil fuel lobbyists as leaders of the EPA and the Department of the Interior. Why have you voted against climate action even as climate change continues to take a toll on your state? Well, thank you, JC. Thank you for the question. Uh, if you look at those commercials that are running on TV, they talk about the Great American Outdoors Act. This is the most important conservation legislation that has passed the United States Senate in over 50 years. It will create thousands of jobs right here in Colorado. It's the biggest infusion of money into our public lands in the history of our country. The Natural Resources Defense Council has said of that legislation that it addresses two pressing issues of our time. One, climate change, and two, biodiversity. That bill that just got signed into law addresses climate change. I've also uh, passed a, a nearly 50 percent increase in funding of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory right here in Colorado uh, to focus on efforts to address climate change, to reduce emissions. But my plan doesn't include laying off 230,000 Coloradans. That's what John's plan would do. John would destroy the livelihoods of 230,000 Colorado families because he wants to make their job obsolete. Just a few miles down the road from us, Weld County relies on those jobs. My hometown <laughs> relies on those jobs. But John Hickenlooper, his plan is to shoot those jobs down. I didn't hear you address your specific votes that were related to the greenhouse gas emissions from power plants and your confirmations to the EPA and the Department of the Interior. Well, look, I, if, you, if you look at the work that we continue to do, the Great American Outdoors Act addresses climate change. If you look at the other votes, uh, I'm sure they're, the number of jobs that they would have cost was too high. I don't think we have to punish our economy in order to achieve reductions in pollution and to address climate change. What, what those rules and regulations would have done is driven up the cost of electricity in Colorado for those who can least afford it. And when it comes to appointees, I'm excited about the fact that Colorado has uh, its Secretary of Interior from Rifle Colorado in place in Washington, D.C. We were just in Colorado breaking ground under Arkansas Valley Conduit. That's the kind of work that we need to continue to do, but I will not destroy the economy in pursuit of a radical, further than Green New Deal uh, agenda. Since you were new check there, would you like to have 30 seconds for a rebuttal? You bet I would. Uh, just because you have one environmental bill doesn't make you an environmentalist. Uh, the NRDC endorsed me, uh, not Cory Gardner. I think we should recognize that uh, he, has roll, he has voted to roll back clean air and clean water protections. He voted to put a, 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 a coal lobbyist in charge of the EPA, and we're replacing two coal-fired electrical plants with wind, solar, and batteries, and the monthly electric bill is going to go down. And that's what the future is, is we're going to transition to a clean energy economy. It's going to make six times more jobs than are going to be lost. Are those jobs going to be replaced in Craig that were lost as a result of those closures? All right. Closings? I, I've got a specific question for Mr. Hickenlooper on your oil and gas record. Uh, you supported the industry during your tenure as governor, and you even drank fracking fluid at one point to prove that it was safe. Now you're pushing for 100 percent renewable electricity. Why did you change your stance on oil and gas drilling, and why should people who care about climate change trust that you'll follow through on your platform? Well, let's be very clear. I always was focusing on, on climate change. I got a master's in earth and environmental science in 1979. We didn't call it climate change. We called it the greenhouse effect, but we knew it had the potential to be an existential threat uh, to all of mankind, and we're seeing those consequences now. Uh, what we did in Colorado, uh, we were the first state to hold the oil and gas industry accountable and to create methane regulations, which, you know, methane, when it's vented, is 80 times more harmful to climate than CO2. And yet, 
Those methane regulations were, were, were rolled out by Canada as national policy. They were rolled out by the United States uh, as national policy until, of course, uh, President Trump came in uh, and with, support of, with the support of Cory Gardner, they got rid of our methane regulations. Uh, not only that, they, they rolled back the, the limitations on uh, emissions from vehicles, uh, you know, from, from coal generation, all these things, all these plants, all these emissions are now going unchecked. If I could respond, actually the court just struck down those methane regulations. The methane regulations still stand in Colorado. Uh, he may have drank the fracking fluid, but he's also drank the Kool-Aid now. Uh, the fact is he himself said he wanted to go further, further than the Green New Deal. Make no mistake about, about it, what that means for Colorado. If you work in oil and gas, he wants you gone from your job. If you work in the coal mines around Craig, Colorado, he wants you gone from those jobs. That's your record, and you've set it. You're running TV commercials about the fact that you've closed those down. Mr. Gardner, thank you. 30 seconds for you to respond, and we'll move on. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. The, the, the bottom line is that uh, we're going to create far more jobs through a new energy economy than are ever going to be lost. Uh, we are going to get to clean energy, and it is going to be less expensive. But we've got to do this in an in a, in a, in a integrated basis on a national level. So we've got to take the, the best practices we started here in Colorado, move them out. Again, Cory Gardner has, has voted again and again to roll back the protections for clean air, clean water. He didn't just go neutral on climate change. He actually took us in the wrong direction. Thank you, Mr. Hickenlooper. Mr. Gardner, your signature promise when you were running for the Senate was, quote, when my party is wrong, I'll say it. Democrats point to your unwavering loyalty to President Trump and Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and say that you broke that promise. But there's another way to look at it in which the promise holds, but that would mean that the reason why you don't defy them is because you think that they're right almost all the time. Can you explain how you view that pledge and whether you've kept it? I continue to stand up for the people of Colorado time and time again. I continue to fight for those jobs in Colorado that John Hickenlooper wants to destroy. Uh, I've fought against my party on immigration because I believe we need an immigration policy that works. I fought against my party on marijuana legalization because I believe states' rights matters and the state of Colorado uh, is leading the way. I, I fought against my party when it comes to conservation. It's why we convinced the president to change his mind on permanent funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. We have pa I have passed 11 bills into law. I'm the third most bipartisan member of the United States Senate for a reason. Because I believe if you build in that support with Republicans and Democrats, you can get things done. Now, I'm sure that not every Democrat in the state, including John Hickenlooper, is happy with my record, probably because Gardner ends in R. But the fact is we have been able uh, to get things done for the state, supporting the people of Colorado, supporting the people of Colorado 100% of the time. Things like moving the Bureau of Land Management to Colorado. That's and time. I will continue to fight for this state. Mr. Hickenlooper, you've been the boss in previous elected roles and in the private sector. That's one of the reasons you gave for not wanting to be a senator and saying you wouldn't be good at it. You're asking voters to pick you for a job six years guaranteed. Uh, that's a long time to be testing out whether, it's, whether or not it's something you'd be good at. What was the last job you had where you weren't the boss? And were you any good at it? <laughs> um, uh, so the last job I had was the boss. I was an, uh, a geologist uh, back in the early 1980s. Uh, but certainly, as the boss, as a small business owner, I was the, the optimist. I was the problem solver. But I only did that by bringing the whole team together. As a mayor, as a governor, I wasn't the, the, the person that, that uh, had to dominate every conversation. Our success was because we attracted people that knew how to get things done. And that's really the problem in Washington. You, you hear all the things that Cory Gardner says, it sounds like everything in Washington's fine. They've got all these bills, but nothing's changing. Nothing's, nothing's really happening that is going to change our lives, going to address climate change. Look at the pre-existing conditions. His bill, I mean, five independent fact checkers say that in his precious bill, there is no protections for people with pre-existing conditions. If you remember one thing tonight, that that lie is not just a lie to me or to the viewers, it's a lie to 2.4 million Coloradans who already have pre-existing medical conditions. Mr. Hickenlooper, it was another introspective question and I heard a lot about Cory Gardner, but you said you were a geologist. The second half of the question was, were you any good at it? Yeah, no, I, uh, I think, well, to be very blunt, I was a good geologist, but I was not a great geologist. And I remember to this day, I was out of work for two years uh, after, I, after the, the industry collapsed in the mid-80s, and I finally ended up opening one of the first brew pubs in the country. And I remember the first day when I walked into that restaurant, 
and, and the electricity and, and having brought people together and creating a team that was really going to do something special. We were going to kind of resurrect a whole economy in Lower Downtown. That, I knew I was going to be 10 times better at running that restaurant than I ever was as a geologist. Thank you, Mr. Hickenlooper. After that deep dive into a LinkedIn profile, uh, we will <laughs> shift to a discussion about whether an American president will peacefully give up power after losing the hallmark of our republic for centuries. Ernest Lunning from ColoradoPolitics.com has a question for Mr. Gardner. Senator, uh, President Trump several times has refused to commit himself to a peaceful transfer of power after the election. In a last week's debate, Vice President Mike Pence also wouldn't say whether he will accept a peaceful transfer of power. As we saw here in Denver over the weekend, things in this country are at a boiling point. First, are you okay with the president you're endorsing being anything less than clear on this question? And second, win or lose, what concrete steps will you take to make sure there is a peaceful transfer of power at the White House? Well, thank you, Ernest. Uh, the president should be crystal clear. Every single person in this country should be crystal clear. Uh, there will be a peaceful transition of power. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Kyle said that that's the hallmark of our democracy. I think that's the exact statement that I put out. Uh, this is the hallmark of democracy, a peaceful transition. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And we will follow the Constitution. What we will do about it, we will follow the law. We will follow the Constitution. Now, Governor Hickenlooper's last question, he was asked what the last job he had where he wasn't in charge. Well, you know what, I can tell you right now, I have one of those jobs where I'm not in charge. It's the people of this country and the people of this state that are in charge of this position in the United States Senate. I work for the people of Colorado. We all work for the people of our country as elected officials to the United States Congress. And what you've heard in his answer is yet once again an example of somebody who wants to go to Washington not realizing they work for the people, that they're the boss, they're in charge. That's what matters in this election. Thank you. Now some questions about the role big tech plays in our lives and in politics. Mr. Hickenlooper, I'll start with you. You supported bringing Amazon's second headquarters to Colorado. Do America's big tech companies like Amazon, Google, and Facebook stifle competition? And do you see the need for any specific additional regulation? So we're seeing, and over the last, I think it's eight years now or nine years, we've seen a dramatic or a consistent but over time, a dramatic decline in the number of new businesses started every year. And I think there's no question, that it's not just big tech. There is a level of consolidations and, and, and corporate size that, uh, based on a number of different pol polls, makes small businesses at a serious disadvantage. Certainly when we look at the responses from COVID and the first CARES Act, it really didn't have sufficient support for the truly small businesses. They're the back backbone of America. So whether you're looking at Amazon or, or, or Google, uh, this be, these behemoth companies uh, have to be much more responsible to their communities. And they've got to be able to address the issues of their size and, and how it squelches competition, how it inhibits entrepreneurs from starting businesses, or else they're going to have to deal with the consequences. And I think we've seen in the past that we have sets of laws that, that demonstrate that size can be a barrier to uh, c competition and, and innovation. Thank you. Now, a quick 30 second follow up. What should social media giants do about disinformation, misinformation, and conspiracy theories online? And if they don't take action, is that a place for Congress to get involved? Well, that's one of the, 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 the trickiest questions you're going to get. I mean, this country is based around the, the notion of free speech, that that is one of our most sacred rights, uh, and we shouldn't lightly discuss it. That being said, We've got to have some confidence in the media that we're, where we're getting our news that, that they're getting real facts. And uh, I think we are long past the time where Facebook and, and, and these large media giants, these behemoth tech companies, they have to be responsible for what, Thank for whether, you, Mr. whether it's truth or, time or, is up. Or, or untruth. Mr. Gardner, uh, tech, social media, and extremism kind of come together online. Last week, Facebook cracked down on accounts spreading the QAnon conspiracy theory, reclassifying it as a militia. You have campaigned alongside QAnon supporting congressional candidate Lauren Boebert. Uh, for those who don't know, QAnon is the conspiracy theory that President Trump will soon round up and execute Democrats for eating babies. The president himself has praised QAnon believers. If we could start with a yes or no question to kind of guide our conversation on this. Do you share the FBI's view that QAnon is a domestic terror threat? 
Well, I don't believe in QAnon, and yes, I believe they're a threat. Yeah, no, and I, I've yeah. never heard anybody suggest that you do yeah, believe in it. I was just asking about the, F, about the FBI. Um, to follow up on the larger issue uh, then, so if you trust the FBI that it's a domestic terror threat, why would you campaign along somebody, alongside somebody who's expressed support for it? Well, if you listen to Lauren Boebert, she says she did not and does not. But she uh, did, and that's, you could just well, Google I think, it. Well, uh, I think if she would listen to her explanation, she talks, look, I'm not here to defend uh, Lauren Boebert for something that she did or didn't say. You can take your interpretation of what she did or didn't say. I take her at her word that she does not believe or support uh, QAnon. That's her fact. Look, the bottom line is extremism is not something that we should accept in this country on the left or the right. And we must condemn that hate every single time that we can. There's no room for white supremacy. There's no room for discrimination in this country. We have to stop uh, people who want to spread that kind of misinformation. But we also can't allow our big tech companies in Silicon Valley to stifle legitimate speech, whether it's on the left or the right. Uh, I've said this before, one of the concerns I have is if you have 2,000 censors in San Francisco or 2,000 censors in Washington, D.C., which is worse? We need a mechanism to hold them accountable to find the truth and make sure that extremism doesn't uh, play. I am worried about Governor Hickenlooper's record, though, when it comes to big companies. Like Anna Darko, who actually paid for policy initiatives in his governor's office, uh, they had a, a pay-to-play plan where corporations would pick offices, initiatives, and policies they paid for in his office. Thank you. That's time. Uh, that's something that has been discussed uh, throughout the campaign. Uh, Mr. Hickenlooper, 30 seconds to respond, and we'll move on, specifically on your actions regarding Anna Darko and those positions in your office. So we had public-private partnerships like the governors before me. Uh, Governor Polis uh, is utilizing them now. They're a way when you have tight budgets to uh, provide uh, resources to uh, various programs. For us, it was getting... Uh, books in the hands of four-year-olds. It was making sure that we had uh, uh, senior efforts to make our, the, the state more hospitable for seniors. Uh, USA Today, or, or yes, USA Today, ranked us one of the top states for, for seniors recently. I mean, these were efforts where we were transparent. That's time. See, we, Thank you. We haven't done great on the yes or no, but we'll try again. <laughs> uh, some yes or no to let voters know where you stand on a few things. Next, viewers tell us they don't have enough information on Amendment B, the repeal of the Gallagher Amendment, which, if repealed, keeps residential property taxes from going down like they're supposed to. Do you support it first to Mr. Hickenlooper? Uh, Amendment B? Yes. Yes, I do. Mr. Gardner? I don't believe in increasing taxes on residences, uh, no. Uh, you two disagree uh, on a lot of different things, but I'm curious whether you believe that your opponent here is a moral and ethical man. Mr. Gardner, do you believe that of Mr. Hickenlooper? Well, thank you. I have grave concern with Governor Hickenlooper. It's a yes or no question, sir. Uh, I, look, I have grave concern about his contempt, <laughs> how he can stand in front of us and say there are only two We're charges. We're not going to filibuster the yes or no. Thank you. Mr. Hickenlooper, do you believe that Mr. Gardner is a moral and ethical man? Yes. Do you believe that President Trump is a moral and ethical man, Mr. Hickenlooper? No. Mr. Gardner? Uh, yes. Uh, I wish he would be more uh, specific. Thank you in his communications the American people. Some ballot questions here. Colorado's Proposition 115 would outlaw abortion after 22 weeks except to save the woman's life. Do you support this, Mr. Gardner? Yes, I'm pro-life. Mr. Hickenlooper? No. Coloradans are being asked to join the National Popular Vote Compact, Proposition 113. It would award our electoral college votes to the candidate who gets the most votes nationwide. If it passes, it would not take effect this election. Do you support the National Popular Vote Compact, Mr. Hickenlooper? Uh, I'm not sure. It's a double negative, but yes. You support, yes, Mr. Mr. Gardner. The question was, uh, do I support the national popular vote? Would you vote yes or no on Pro Proposition 113? Uh, I want to keep the Electoral College because I believe Colorado's electoral vote should be so cast the answer here, is so I no. believe is no, yes. Uh, Proposition 118 would create a paid family and medical leave program that would provide 12 weeks of paid time off for family and medical reasons through a payroll tax paid half by employees, half by employers. Mr. Gardner, do you support uh, that? I, I'm still trying to figure out the impact on businesses, small businesses in particular. Mr. Hickenlooper. Yeah, I support it. We're the only industrialized country that doesn't have paid family leave. Thank you both. It's time now for our closing statements by a flip of a coin earlier. Uh, Mr. Gardner will go first. You both have 60 seconds. Mr. Gardner. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Nine News, the Coloradan and Colorado politics for this chance to be here today. Uh, we're in northern Colorado. This state is far more than the front range, I-25. It's the eastern plains and the western slope. It's a state that has been made great by early pioneers and Native Americans. It's a state that's been made great by our immigrants who have fought hard in agriculture and engineering and medical sciences. It's a state that this university has played a, a dramatic role in developing. We need somebody in Washington who's going to fight tooth and nail for all four corners of this state. 
somebody who believes that I-70 doesn't end in Vail, that I-70 doesn't end in Strasburg, that we value every job, whether it's in Craig, Colorado, or Weld County and Greeley, Colorado, those jobs matter. I've been honored to serve in the United States Senate the last six years as the most, third most bipartisan member of the U.S. Senate, passing more legislation than the entire Colorado congressional delegation combined. I'd be honored to have your support for the next six years as we fight corner to corner for the people of this great state. Thank you very much, Mr. Gardner. Mr. Hickenlooper, your closing statement, you have 60 seconds. Well, thank you to CSU and to Nine News for a lively debate. Uh, as I predicted, we saw an avalanche, a barrage of attacks, of, of lies and distortions and, and exaggerations. I think people see through that. And I know that people understand the stakes that are involved. Colorado has a choice. Are we going to protect health care for people with pre-existing conditions, or are we going to take it away? Are we going to tackle climate change head on and protect our environment? Or are we going to keep rolling back clean air and clean water regulations like we've been doing? Are we going to are we going to step up and, and give away more tax breaks to corporations and wealthy Americans, or are we going to recreate our economy in a way that, that actually allows more people to create their own American dream? Nothing is going to change if we don't change Washington. I want, that's why I have to ask why I need your support and why I, I need your vote. Together, we can change Washington. Thank you, Mr. Hickenlooper. Uh, we do a lot of these debates. I think it's rare for us to have a stage with so many combined years of public service uh, to Colorado. On the off chance that uh, one of your two careers in public service ends this November, uh, we extend thanks on behalf of the people of Colorado for the many years that you have served this state. Uh, despite the cynicism that exists today, uh, there is still good to be done in public service, and both of you have been in the arena for a long time. So thank you very much, and thank you for being here tonight. No, thank you. Thank you as well to all of the wonderful hosts at Colorado State University that were willing to bear with us through a pandemic year to put together a debate that uh, got good information to voters and kept everybody here safe. Thank you to our partners at the Colorado and coloradopolitics.com, along with the radio and TV partners who ensured that this debate was broadcast to every corner of Colorado. If you missed any of this debate, want to watch it again, want to share it with somebody who is undecided on this Senate race, you can find a link to the full commercial free hour at 9news.com and on the next YouTube channel. Some voting reminders. In Colorado, you can register and vote all the way up until Election Day. Ballot drop boxes are already open. In-person voting centers start opening on Monday, October 19th. If you're voting by mail, make sure that you're getting in at least a week before Election Day on November 3rd. So Monday, October 26th should be your deadline for a mail-in ballot. The 9 News Voter Guide can be found on 9news.com. Details on the voting process, races of interest. Marshall Zellinger, the smartest man I know, breaks down all of the ballot issues if you want to sort through the all caps language. And you can join us weeknights at 6 o'clock on Next as we go through the ballot page by page together and then all drop it off together. Thanks for joining us for Next Presents, the race for the Senate. For Marshall Zellinger and everyone at 9 News, I'm Kyle Clark. Good night. My son Eli has autism and complex care needs. For years, I fought to expand Medicaid to cover more services for kids and adults with disabilities. Then John Hickenlooper made that happen. It was extraordinary. Cory Gardner, he voted against protecting any pre-existing condition. He even voted against treatment for autism. Who does that? John Hickenlooper is what a public servant should be, caring and effective. I'm John Hickenlooper, and I approve this message. Who's there for you if a drunk goes too far? We are. Get the picture. Tonight, I bring you eight contestants with dreams of becoming rich. Well, then again, they also had dreams of becoming an astronaut, having a pony, being on the cover of Rolling Stone. But for one of them, finally, a dream will come true. But in a nightmare battle of trivial knowledge, the other seven will be sent home, their fleeting fantasies of fortune unfulfilled. On the weakest link, 